our AD was like sending their her publicist like everywhere, like outside and back in, like pretending he didn't know where we were filming. <laughs> So yeah, I'm. It, I you know I've I've watched since season one, and it's so funny like seeing sort of the progression, and especially like you've become so much more recognizable. I think just broadly, and so it's kind of mind boggling to me that you're still able to pull this off. Like, surely it, like at this point, the some people are like in on it, right? No, no one's ever in on it, because uh, that's would be whack what's the point of what's the point of showing something like that i disguise myself a lot this season i rock the ponytail and the glasses and i would wear covid masks sometimes just to hide my face partially so um where there's a will where there's a way we used to worry about like oh am i going to be more recognizable and stuff like that but then we the best example i give people is that Sasha Baron Cohen did Bruno right after Bora. Bora made like $200 million, international hit, got Oscars, you know, it was a cultural phenomenon. And he was able to do Bruno immediately afterwards. And he just changed his hair, changed his outfit and changed his accent. No special effects, prosthetics, nothing. So. Well, uh, and like, what about like for getting people on? Cause I know you've talked about like how you guys lie and stuff, but uh, we don't we just, lie. We don't lie. We don't <laughs> to get lie. them on, yes, you do. We bend the truth. <laughs> well, like I mean, we omit. We omit information, but surely there's hell to pay at the end of like after the the show. Are people pissed? Like publicists? Sometimes. Do Sometimes. I mean? Like, are there any repercussions, or is it? It's it's fine. Sometimes, usually people are a good sport. The majority of people are a good sport. So and there's a lot of I, 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 I lay on the charm after the interview. You it's do. Like, and so when they're leaving, you you kind of like it, it's all. There's a lot of yeah, but it's genuine. I mean, I'm not like maliciously. Uh, there's no malicious intent. Like I'm not trying to actually ruin somebody's day. I'm just yeah. I'm in character. I'm in character. I'm trying to just be like the most absurd and and incompetent talk show host of all time. So, uh, you know, I'm just razzing. But I mean, you know, celebrities, they have fragile egos. So I could see that maybe not. Uh... I don't think they take it personally. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's case by case. There are some celebs that have walked out and I, we've gotten some, we've gotten into some hairy, hairy situations. I was curious if there's a, like a, a particular interview that you're like really proud of or like you can't believe that you pulled off in throughout the show's history. The Damon John interview this season is my favorite one. And I, we could have honestly aired the entire, like, cause I interviewed each person for like an hour. We could have like aired all the raw footage and it would have been just as amazing. Like he was thrown top to bottom. He was just so incredible. It was like, it's just so absurd. And he's just shocked the entire time. There's a time that he looked into the camera in disbelief, which is incredibly <laughs> captivating. <laughs> so you really, are you really still keeping people for an hour? At the least, sometimes an hour and a half, two hours. That's, that is, it's, I mean, I just, I, I cannot fathom how you can convince people that they need to be there for an hour. And then that. We just go, we just go for it. We've sent publicists on a wild goose chase. So we don't let the publicists into the, where the stage is and we'll show them like fake monitor feeds and stuff. Robin Gibbons, her publicist was like, she needs to get, you need to get him out of there right away. <laughs> and then we just kept sending her. On like a wild goose chase through the stage like i didn't do that i was interviewing robin gibbons in the in the in the middle of the interview but like uh uh our ad was like sending their her publicist like everywhere like outside and back in like pretending he didn't know where we were filming <laughs> i mean the funny thing is like i mean i could see it kind of being good for them like i mean i guess it depends on yeah how it's react. like a comedy central roast it shows them that it shows the yeah. world they have a sense of humor about themselves yeah yeah i am curious you know something that's funny is like i you know obviously the show is so absurd and it's like just entertaining and fun but like i think part of what's resonated about it for people is like there is something poetic and like they like they like the justice of like seeing 
celebrities in particular get pranked? Do you feel like it's like scratching this like philosophical itch maybe? Maybe, I don't know. It's almost like that's a question more for the fans than for me. I'm not sure what people, each person gets out of it. I think like it's a break from the kind of fictitious propaganda of traditional press, I think. I think people are like, these people aren't friends. This person isn't mentally stable, this actor. Have you ever met an actor before? They're like completely psychotic. <laughs> That's why they're good at acting. That's why they're watchable. You know, you're not like, like Sean Penn doesn't go home. He's like, I'm going to bed at 9.30 p.m. tonight. He like, he's like, <laughs> oh. so I think like when these like psychopaths come on like Jimmy Fallon and they're like, hey, you know, on set, George Clooney played a prank on me or whatever. They have some like anecdote from set. It feel, people could, people could smell it's a little inauthentic. So yeah. I think it's like a nice, a, a nice break from, I don't know, I, I really don't know. I mean, is really that kind of what you, so I guess for you, was that something that you were thinking when you went into creating the show? I don't know. I, I don't know. No, it was never like that academic. It wasn't like, I'm going to, I need to do this to celebrities because it was just like, more coming from my id. It was just like, what would be, what would crack me and my friends up? In the moment, are you like trying to not laugh or are you like really like calculating every next step? Like what's going through your head? I'm calculating every next step. I, I if I have a mark on a hook, if I if somebody pranking is on the hook, I don't want to laugh. I've, I've done so much work and so much prep has gone into bringing that prank into production that I don't, I don't want to be the one that blows it you know it's so, so hard. it's like yeah. high stakes high stakes <laughs> months and months and months and months go into planning one little dumb two minute have you right. always been good at like at not laughing when you're like pulling a joke on yeah because I'm pretty I'm pretty nervous like the adrenaline is high so I'm not like I'm not in like a sit back relax and laugh kind of mood I feel mm -hmm. like a, a tremendous amount of pressure Mm -hmm. So, uh, and my brain is split in a million directions. So, uh, Bad Trip is like, it's like on my top four on Letterboxd. Like, it's so brilliant. Oh, thanks. So good. Thank um, I can't believe I, I was listening to the Howard Stern interview. I didn't realize you didn't make any money on that. Like, what the? I, I just like can't. Yeah. I, I remember like following it too. And like, we were like, I was so excited for it to come in theaters. And, um, like, yeah, I just don't, is it just the COVID stuff that was, or is it like, was there legal thing? Yeah, well, so, so we, so we decided to take as little money up front as possible and get profit participation on the back end. And so that we could put all the money, all the little, the little budget we had for Bad Trip, we could put it all in front of the camera and not be greedy up front and bet on ourselves and hope that the movie was a box office success and, and tickets would sell and we would make money. But then COVID shut it down and there was no such thing as a box office, uh, yeah. you know, profit. So, um, and then MGM was trying to sell the movie to Quibi behind our backs. And the only reason they got caught with their hand in the cookie jars because Jeff Tremaine had final cut and Quibi requires you cut the, uh, cut whatever you're using up into like six iPhone ratio segments. So they would have to like reopen the cut. It's the only reason they were going to do it without telling us. <laughs> and they got caught. And shout out to my producer, Dave Bernat, Emmy Award winning White Lotus producer, Dave Bernat, who saved the movie from, from, I've never seen the light of day. So he told the guy from MGM, he was like, uh, look, you can't sell it to Quibi. We have Final Cut. And the guy was like, wait, what? And then he, and then he was like, why don't you sell it to Netflix? And, and he was like, no, we tried a bunch of times. Netflix doesn't want it. Turned out they send it to somebody no one's ever heard of at the wrong department at Netflix. Oh my God. We sent it to the head of the film department at Netflix and he loved it. They, they, MGM even sent it to Amazon just to review to see if they wanted to purchase it or not. And Amazon leaked it by accident. It was like a disaster. It was like disastrous. So I was like miserable. And it was like quarantine began uh all the misery that came with that and 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 then netflix the right person at netflix saw it and loved it loved it loved it 
and they bought it off of MGM for a profit, like a small profit. So like they were willing to take a loss. And that's the other thing. They were willing to take under what they paid for it from Quibi rather than more. They were willing to be in the red with Quibi than in the black with Netflix. So just from a business, it was like, wh- who is running this company? Um, it, it's just like from, yeah, it didn't make sense from like, just like a brass tax perspective. Uh, and then, uh, and then Netflix was great. They like put a ton of support into marketing it. They had really, their marketing team was amazing and really creatively collaborative and positive mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. attentive and responsive. And we became the number one movie in the world. And, and we got certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, yada, yada, but I didn't make a dime. <laughs> I didn't make any mm-hmm. money. And the, movie took, the movie took seven and a half years between like the earliest writings to when it premiered to go eight years. It, was that just because of like just everything that had to go into or it just like was by nature of you doing it? We, we didn't really know how to write a movie. So we were like writing from like the end of season two of the Argonne show from like 2013 to like 2016. We were writing and developing the idea on and off between seasons. And then finally we went out and pitched like a bad version of the movie and nobody bought it. Then we, we had to like start again from uh, zero and like write a completely new version of the movie. Then we sold it. Then we shot some and then like um, we needed to reshoot some and then Rel Fox show got picked up. So he had mm-hmm. to wait until his, his show was finished um, filming to come back for the reshoot. So there's just all these interruptions uh and then finally when it was about to to premiere um COVID. Yeah, COVID. so that was like another delay and then finally wow. when netflix bought it netflix was like great it'll come out like a year from now because we have to dub and sub it in oh. 60 languages so we're like oh God, interesting. but i also think it came out the perfect time in the pandemic i agree yeah yeah it was like it was it it was like a very yeah the timing wise it was like there was a we were kind of like you know I think I had like just gotten my second shot like I'm still yeah. good yeah so totally yeah yeah it was a little bit kismet the time it came out um I know you you told Howard Stern that um you were excited that you felt like it had opened up some some new possibilities is it like more movie stuff uh or is it just you know you can't talk about them <laughs> there's a couple companies that don't want me to answer that question <laughs> i'll tell you when the time is right i'm also superstitious right. it's not even it's not even my corporate overlords it's superstition so i'll tell you when the time is right Okay. So it's interesting because I feel like with the Arcondo show, like for the past few seasons, you go out with such a bang and then we don't hear anything. And it's like, I I think the Stormy Daniels, was that season five? Yeah. Well, I was going to end the show after five seasons. And then I didn't make any money on Bad Trip. So like, well, gotta so go back, gotta go back so to the we're, factory. We're benefiting from your uh, from your misfortune. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't just a monetary decision. I also like at the end of season five, I was like, why permanently close the door on a show where I have full creative freedom? Like, why not just like attend to other projects when I want to attend to other projects and come back to the show when I feel like coming back to the show? Yeah. Adult Swim is 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 lax and loose and lets me do whatever I want and come back whenever I want. So. I didn't want to be like, oh, it's officially over the way I intended Mm -hmm. season five to be the the end. So you're you're saying you're kind of still leaving that door open maybe for another. Yeah, I always leave the door open. I like that Larry David just takes like five years off (laughs) and like golf. I mean, he has a tremendous amount of more wealth than I could ever imagine. But, um, you know, I like that uh, he, he writes when he's inspired. Have you always been uh, really comfortable with nudity or is that something that you had to kind of stomach for the show? I don't think I'm comfortable to this day. I just like, there's not a lot of things that are like completely jaw dropping, shocking. So uh, <laughs> nudity is just like um, kind of like a, a guaranteed reaction. Yeah. You're mining, you're mining for reactions. You're like yeah. fishing. Yeah. So, so uh, you got to do what it takes. 
And then I remember one time when, when Flavor Flav was on and he afterwards like was all pissed and was like, that the kick didn't really happen. Like, yeah, do you guys yeah. do that a lot? Do you edit stuff in like that a lot? Hannibal kicked Flavor Flav in the in face. <laughs> But and he, I dare him, I dare him to come on this Zoom right now and say otherwise. <laughs> well, I mean, it's yeah, it's that's I guess that's why I was like, or like the Lance Reddick part bit when he like comes back and like he was kind of in on it, right? He was like he was, yeah, like he was unflappable. So we were like, listen, man, LeVar Burton was supposed to show up and we <laughs> wrote this bit for him and we didn't like, can you just put the, these clothes on? But that's kind of the only time we did that. And once we did that, season one and season two, I don't really count. Once we did that, we realized like, we can't, it's called wrong side of the desk. It's like, you can't prank some guests and not prank others because then mm -hmm. the audience thinks everybody's in on it. And it's like, yeah, it's like I've spent a decade convincing the audience that nobody's in on it. So you can't really play that. Even if you play that game once, it ruins it for the rest. It spoils the whole batch. So you gotta, um, you gotta, no, nobody's allowed in on it. After that yeah. Lance Reddick, after that Lance Reddick, but it was great, and 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 also rest in peace to yeah. a, an amazing actor. And he was a sweetheart uh, to to the whole cast and crew. He was like a total gentleman, sweetheart. So, um, so I'm so glad that we got a great, crazy thing out of him, a great, crazy performance out of him before he passed away. I think about Blarf and your music background. Um, I'm curious if you are thinking about doing any more musical projects or if you feel like you are utilizing your experience in music at all um, with, you know, the show. I mean, I, I, I'm i guessing you kind of pick, I know, you said that you guys picked the band on a, um, what's that site? Uh, Craigslist? Craig, yeah, Craigslist. Yeah. yeah. Is that really, is that true? Yeah, or like, uh, back pages or like gigster like those kind of websites um but yeah so do you feel like you're getting to use your your degree or your experience in music at all kind of, i mean comedy is about timing and music is about timing and like temporal <laughs> arts so yeah you do there's a little crossover there did you like tar i didn't see it oh you didn't she talks about it being music and timing Sorry, music movies are tough for me because they're like musicians aren't that dramatic like whiplash i couldn't see like no jazz teacher i only had jazz professors no none of them act like that they're like the sweetest stonery teddy bears if any of them acted like the guy in whiplash they would have been kicked out of school like immediately <laughs> people were like what the f are you doing <laughs> he's like throwing symbols at people's head he's like play that lee morgan song again you <laughs> I was like, what? It's just jazz music, man. It's a it's an irrelevant language. I know. I was laughing at your your interview magazine interview. Um, I I feel like you were being a little modest with like who can get into music school, unless you're just trying to pull back the curtain and really expose it for what it is. Uh maybe a little bit of both. I mean, like not all music schools are created equally. Like I think Juilliard's a hell of a lot harder than getting into yeah. Berkeley, but um, I don't know. I don't know. It just seemed like some of the students there, like I was like, this guy played music for like five seconds. He's just like a trust fund kid. But uh, isn't that true of any, like any profession, any school? Any school, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. There's nepotism and there's, are you saying that capitalism is unfair? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean. Are you saying yeah. there's flaws in our system? Are you challenging, never, are you challenging I, our system? I would never, I'm a journalist. Built, built by sociopaths? <laughs> are you challenging the system that all, where only sociopaths and their <laughs> children win? Is that what you're talking I feel like you would have actually, I did think about this. I, I thought you, I feel like you would have been a good reporter. Did you ever float that as a career option? I tried to interview Alex Jones at the Republican National Convention and it, it just like went. <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it, was, it was hard getting a, a straight answer out of him. 
just for our last question, I did want to know, like, I, it seems like your um, approach to pranking normal people compared to people like celebrities that come on is di- like Bad Trip was very charitable toward the people in the movie. Is that, is, mm-hmm. that, is that something you're cognizant of? Especially in Bad Trip. In, in, for the Eric Andre show, it's only 11 minutes and it's nonlinear. There's no narrative. And you don't have to fall in love and emotionally connect with me as a protagonist. For a 90 minute movie, the principles of a movie are very different where it's mm-hmm. like, to get across 90 minutes of footage, you have to, the protagonist has to be likable. You have to emotionally invest in them. And if they're like haranguing people, um, then it's gonna get, it's gonna be exhausting to watch. So, so we, we discovered that early and that's like not, that's not a, a, a principle of pranking. That's a principle of like screenplay writing. So, right. so, um, uh, yeah. So because I had to be the likable guy next door, the pranks, I can never be, I, I can never be intentionally destructive in a prank. Mm-hmm. I had to be, um, I had to be, I had to be the butt of the joke and accidentally destructive. Mm. Everything, everything, every every time I'm in peril, it's like, it's an accident (laughs) and I need help. So, um, so, but it it was a happy accident because it made, it kept the movie from feeling cynical. Yeah, exactly. Which again, I think was it, 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 the timing was really good, I think. Yeah. 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 Because people wanted to like return to humanity again. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, totally.